of the Star Spangled Banner sings America's favorite songs with the U.S. Air Force Band and the Singing Sergeants. 22 stirring musical memories, including Cohan and Berlin medleys. So you can catch that. Um, now, you know, they, they, you notice they preempted the soap operas yesterday. However, only a handful of people call Channel 2 to complain, only 32 people call Channel 4, and only 50 people call Channel 7. In contrast, this is to the hundreds who complained when the war coverage bumped the soap opera. So all the stupid people who watched the soap operas, and I'm sure that some of my listeners, they didn't mind that the parade was on. All right? Now, here is a list. Now, these, this, this is the bleep list, okay? As far as I'm concerned, this is the list of people, uh, terrible people who, who marched in this parade, people who really surprise me. This is the gorgeous mosaic spot. You know, the other amazing thing is they have all this parade and the soldiers and, you know, they have airplanes and all this junk. Then they have the gorgeous mosaic. Then they have um, America's vet. Then they have, like, all the other veterans. You know, this is a, at, at which point one network bailed out altogether, you know, at about 3.30. Uh, or Channel 9 bailed out at 3.30 so that all the Korean veterans, the Vietnam veterans, you know, they were at the end of all of this. So you never got to, you never got to see these people. But the... Um, the people who partook, that I am really, well, the Kurdish Forum, the Thunderbird American Indian dancers were in this parade. Boo to you. Um, what else? The Federation. Oh, no, here are these people. Brooke Shields. Well, nobody would ever pay any attention to her anyway. Anne Gillian. Woman survived breast cancer to march in this parade. Paul Sorvino. Jump, sister, jump. All these wonderful women who jump rope, most of whom are black, you know, marched in this parade. Tony Orlando, well, what do you expect from him? The disabled drill team. The lesbian and gay Big Apple Corps band, poo on you. Melba Moore. Kiki Vandaway, who is that? Some athlete. There was a uh, kazoo band. Uh, Keith Carradine, Kevin Dobson, Thomas Hearns, Robert Merrill, Bo Diddley! Bo Diddley was somewhere in that parade. Are you disappointed in these people? I certainly am. Tammy Grimes, Ben Vereen, the Girl Scouts. You know, I mean, then there were all these high school bands, but I mean, you'd think people would have, I don't know, we're out of sync. I'm telling you, you know, you, me. All the rest of us who think this is disgusting. Uh, on C-SPAN, on Saturday, covering the parade in Washington, in Washington, D.C., who, who was the voice describing everything? Willard Scott of the Today Show. But you could figure that. Isn't he the person that Henry Kissinger filled in for him doing um, the weather? I mean, that was an other... You know, there was something so bizarre about this society... Here's Henry Kissinger, a man who caused God only knows how many people to die, you know, during Vietnam, during the whole time he was Secretary of State, thanks to Henry. Who knows how many people are dead? And what does he do for laughs? He does the weather on some television station, and they want him. I mean, there, there is no line anymore between reality and fantasy, between politics and entertainment. You know, go from being the Secretary of State to, you know, playing around being a weatherman on television. But that's because everybody's gotten so stupid, so incredibly stupid. Channel 13 last night had this really interesting program, I think it was called Out of Control, about how easy it would be for a nuclear war to start by accident. Now, this is public television, folks. This is Channel 13, where you would think you would have kind of a better vision of people's intelligence then on a regular channel, I hate this chair. I don't know what's worse, this chair or the chair with no back. Let's try this one. Oh, God, would you people pay your pledges? 
pay your pledges. It would be so nice to have one decent chair in this room. Wouldn't that be nice? We used to have one decent chair. Oh, no, this is even worse. Nah, this chair is worse than the other chair. All right, so on Channel 13, and they have all these simulations, you know, of how, you know, they're saying Israel attacks Syria, and it says simulation, but at the point where they're announcing the attack on the United States, you know, in, in this fictional scenario, at the bottom of the screen, it says simulation. Okay, we all know what simulation means, but at the top of the screen, for the people who don't know what the word simulation means, it said, not actual news. I mean, this is Channel 13. Don't they think people know the meaning of the word simulation? Or were they afraid of having another, you know, like Orson Welles where they landed on Mars, you know, the Martians landed. What was, it? what was the name of that? All right, now, here is the thing. This is how when news comes out too late, you know that nobody will ever believe this, okay? I mean, all again, you know, all the ladies who hang out in the laundromat who all supported the war, you know, who are perfectly nice people, except for that. Uh, Lieutenant Jeffrey Zahn, Zahn, he was the Navy flyer, the first guy that was shot down, the guy everybody saw on television in Iraq, all beaten up, you know, with his face all bruised, and everybody said, oh, look what the Iraqis did. They are monsters. Remember that? Everybody said that. Everybody said that. His name was invoked constantly on the coverage yesterday. You know, people kept talking about him. You know, the same genius, like, I think it was a Bill Butel who thinks Tony Orlando wrote tie a yellow ribbon, which he didn't. Lieutenant Jeffrey Zahn said yesterday, first of all, he said, I don't ever want to kill anybody again. Then referring to the victory celebrations in Washington and New York, he said, the country didn't get to see the cost of the war. I did. They didn't see Iraqi mothers get killed. But this is from today's New York Times. The most interesting thing he said since the bruises on his face were what, you know, just fueled the fire of, the, of this war of people's hatred of Saddam Hussein. He did it to himself so that they wouldn't make him go on television. He said he inflicted some of his facial wounds in an effort to avoid being videotaped. I hit myself in the nose and in the face as hard as I could stand it when I knew they were taking me to a television station. But he said he could not avoid being taped. He said he beat his face even harder when he learned his captors wanted him to tape, to tape him a second time. I beat my right eye until I couldn't see out of it. I tried to break my nose. The idea was not to be put on television. They looked at me and sent me back down. So the fact is, is that they didn't, I mean, he doesn't say they beat him up. Uh, they were treated, they were taken to Baghdad. They were beaten, pardon me, they were beaten. But he did some of this to himself. Uh, about 90% of the time, he said, you felt like you were in danger of losing your life. But he added, all in all, I didn't feel they were the bloodthirsty, amoral people we had heard they were. And this is the guy that everybody saw on television. And instead of this being like some major story, instead of people, I don't know, he's being trained somewhere uh, for some new job. In the he's still in the Navy. Uh, this was all totally ignored. You know, here it is buried somewhere on page, I don't know, 20 or 30 of the New York Times. So there you go. But these people yesterday yelling, USA, USA, th this, these blank-faced people, and you wonder if there indeed really were four million people there, four and a half million people, how many of them are about to be out of jobs? How many of their kids, you know, can't read? How many of them, uh, you know, their daughters have gotten pregnant? How many of their kids are on drugs? How many of them are on drugs? Those are the real problems, the real problems facing this entire society. But it just, it's so easy. It's such a quick fix, isn't it? It's so wonderful to just go out and yell USA with no understanding of what USA means. Does USA mean an occupying police force? 
in a neighborhood? Does USA mean women being hassled by the police and people being forced to show their identification to get into their own buildings because they happen to live near Washington Square Park? You know, what does USA mean to these people? And, you know, are we all from another planet or something? Because it's time to give up. I know you can't even move anywhere. You know, every place is the same. And I am, for the first time, I mean, I'm disappointed in Dinkins about Tompkins Square. This thing with the parade, if he didn't make the parade, everybody would say, he made a parade for Nelson Mandela, but he didn't make a parade. You know, but this guy can't win. You know, I mean, he really might as well give up already. Because I've also been told that, you know, on the Lower East Side, supposedly, they there were more volunteers from that neighborhood for Dinkins than from any other neighborhood in New York. And uh, apparently it's been promised now that uh, for his next campaign, there won't be any volunteers from down there. Well, the police probably won't let them out of their houses. Okay, 212-279-3400. This is Talk Back. I'm Lynn Samuels. I'm the one that's here on Tuesday. Uh, Malachi McCord is here on Monday. And I'm here Tuesday. And Malika Lee Whitney is here on Wednesday. And the one and only Playthel is here on Thursday. And then Joe Hurley's Arts Magazine is here. Oh, there's going to be a new Arts Magazine soon. On the 16th, next Wednesday, I guess. I don't know what time, from like 3 to 4.30 or something. Uh, so we'll see what that is. But in the meantime, Joe Hurley's Arts Magazine is on, on Friday. Is there anything here I should play? Does Paul wonder? Yeah, you have to pay your pledge. If you pledge money, God, do we need money? Do we need money? Oh, everything's falling apart here, including everybody who works here. No, there's nothing... There's nothing that appeals to me in this pile of cards, anyway. All right. So you have to make out your check to Pacifica-WBAI, and you mail it to WBAI, P.O. Box 12345, Church Street Station, New York, New York, 10249. Okay? Okay. You're on the air. Okay. How you doing? Okay. Here we are again, huh? Yes. That was a masterful presentation from your um, opening banter with Mr. Sloan to up to this point. Really, you know, you connected it perfectly and it really hit me. I'm morbid enough to start with, but after your presentation, you're getting me so depressed. I mean, is there any glimmer of hope at all in your scenario? Yeah, we can probably all get a prescription for Valium. Oh, I beat you to it. No, I was thinking more a metaphysical, you know, or artsy sort of escape, but... No, I don't think so. Really? I don't think there's any answer to this. I think the whole Western civilization is falling apart. Yeah. Nobody understands democracy, and nobody understands morals and individual freedom. Nobody understands anything anymore. I certainly don't understand freedom, never having it. Did you see or hear about that latest depressing survey where high school students, whatever the facts are, can't uh, do fourth grade arithmetic or whatever the particulars are. Yeah, they can't do, well, they can't read either. You know, maybe they couldn't do the problems because they couldn't read. <laughs> I don't know. And, you know, now that I've turned 30, I think of all the cliches I heard about people in the 60s saying, don't trust people over 30, and that was don't trust people under 30. So I'm sort of sitting on the fence, uh, you know, if you know what I mean, looking in both directions of mistrust. Well, you can only trust people who are 30. I don't know. <laughs> That's um, it. I'm, oh, I'm getting some feedback, but don't worry. Uh, one good thing, my therapist agrees with us, so if you and I live on Mars, she has a catch ready for us because she was against the war from the start. She even wore, like, a peace symbol when the eve of the war, and she told me she went to some demonstrations on the Upper West Side, and she sort of, you know, has her head together about uh, this whole this whole issue. Well, of course we're right, but you know what? Look, with the bombardment of, of the, the lies in the media and the withholding of information, I mean, it's like this thing about Jeffrey Zahn now. Nobody's going to believe this. I believe it, but... No, but I mean the people that supported the war. You know, I use the ladies that hang out in the laundromat as, the as type, you I know. know the they'll never believe it. Yeah. You know, even though he said that he, he caused some of those injuries himself. Well, in a sense, it doesn't matter what they believe. I mean, they don't yes, even it... probably vote. I mean, you know. Oh, unfortunately, they do. <laughs> um, 
It does matter what people believe because people have been fed propaganda. I mean, did you watch the parade yesterday? Of course not. Oh, well, I watched it, you know, on on television. I watched it on television, but, I mean, it looked like, remember they used to show you the May Day parades in Red Square Uh with the uh soldiers and the tanks and the gun? That's what it looked like. Yeah, they used to always belittle it and make fun of it, uh, the American commentators, that is. Yeah. Yeah, well, now we had our own. It was really disgusting. How did NPR treat it? I didn't get to listen to all things considered. Did they have a thoughtful... um, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't hear it this morning. I mean, I didn't hear it yesterday or this morning. So I don't know. It connects to the person you always talk about, Brian Lehrer. For some reason, I can't get um, NYC AM, but I was listening to Selected Shorts on FM last night, and he was there pitching. But the, uh, let me ask you if you ever heard of this short story. Um, I heard it last night for the second time in five years. It's called All Things That Rise Must, must Converge everything, by Flannery O'Connor. Everything that rises must converge. I know the name of it, but I, mean, I don't know it. Uncanny in terms of life imitating art or art imitating life or anyone who's familiar with that story. It's not so much the plot, but more the dynamics of the relationship. It exactly captures like what's going on with myself and my mother. And I don't know when that story was written, but there's something there, and I'm definitely well, going to investigate the canon of his work and uh i think she's a woman oh i'm i'm sorry well i'm I not sure i think out of college. i think flannery i'm not 100 percent sure i think she's a woman i have to move on anyway okay I'm to let you in and i'll be with you until the end of the show okay thank you bye, bye. yeah isn't flannery o'connor a woman hi you're on lynn yes didn't go to the parade you did not go to the parade. <laughs> I, who don't like crowds of more than two people, would not be found dead at the parade. Even if I approved of the parade, I wouldn't have gone to the parade. Well, I agree with you about the crowds. I mean, I, I didn't approve of the parade. I'm one of those people who would, who was very highly upset because my soaps were interrupted. But I handle it because some of the soaps that I watched came on at a different time. So I really wasn't... Well, I can read you from the paper what they're doing. They're actually rescheduling. What you're losing is Thursdays. Here, okay, here. This is this tell. Chan- oh, Chan- a, a Channel 4 reporter got... Uh, arrested, yeah. Arrested. He's, he's, in fact, I'm watching him now. Oh, all right. Channel 2 moved The Young and the Restless to 4, four o'clock. o'clock. Yeah. Channel 7 will air yesterday's soap operas today. 7, so... And they will be behind the rest of the country through Thursday. Then on Friday, Channel 7 is going to show Friday, which means you're never going to see Thursday's program. Well, I don't watch Channel 7. I don't watch Genital Hospital. And I don't watch... Oh, well, they didn't explain what the other channels did. But, yeah, but John Miller also... This is oh. also interesting. Yeah. There was a skirmish between some of the demonstrators, I guess, and the police. And John Miller was near there, and he went with his camera people, and the police told him to get out, and he said, no, this is news, you know, like I'm covering news. And he ended up getting arrested. Yeah, Another World came on at 9 o'clock today. Honey, as far as I'm concerned, it was another world all afternoon yesterday. (laughs) That was another world. um, The reason I called really was because of jungle fever. Yeah, which I haven't seen, which I really have no desire to see. Well, because they had um, Spike Lee and Stevie Wonder on Oprah a few why? minutes ago. just went off a few minutes ago. Why, th- why them together? What is their connection? Because Stevie Wonder did some of the music. Oh, okay. Okay? Well, I like Stevie Wonder. We won't get into that. You, you knew I was a raving lunatic last week. Yeah, you sound a little chilled out this <laughs> week. Good. Yeah, yeah. But that was the connection between Spike Lee and oh. Wonder. He did some of the music for the movie i think it would be very interesting but I, you know the thing that bothers me is that i don't want to pay seven and a half dollars i'll movie. tell you something the reviews i could have gone to see it actually for free and i didn't go because it was at eight thirty and it was too late and all of this yeah. but the reviews i've been reading say that it's it's basically very shallow that the characters are very shallow you know and that he doesn't really and it's, you know, also, I was under the impression it's about an interracial romance, which it is in one way, but it's about a married man having an affair with a woman. Who you has, know, has he a happens black to be... A man and a white woman. Yeah, but the thing is, is once you, you inject the idea that one of them is, is cheating on his wife and having an affair, you know, the, 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 to me that kind of changes... Changes everything. Everything. And frankly, Spike Lee is starting to get on my nerves. He's so 
arrogance. He's so nasty. Who the hell does he think he is? And, oh, and another thing, he, he he mentioned it too, that part of most of the movie's been dedicated to Yusuf Hawkins, which is I have no problem with. But he said that most of the stuff in the movie, you know, the racial stuff, you know, how the Italian Benson people in Bensonhurst are, are reacting to this woman dating a black man from Harlem or wherever it is that he's from, you know. And basically that's how the whole Yusef Hawkins thing started because he was black. He was going to a white neighborhood, but not to, to date a no, white girl. No, but they thought, yeah, but another. that's what they thought apparently. Yeah, that's what those baboons who killed him thought. They thought that he was there to go to this Gina chick's party. Yes. But she she hasn't been was. arrested for a while, has she? <laughs> Remember last summer she was getting arrested every five minutes? Yeah, she was getting arrested every five minutes because, you know, she was, she jumped one time. The turnstiles, but she was carrying crack or something on her at the time? Yeah, she jumped the turnstiles, yeah, and she had a thing of crack on her, and then she got arrested another. Wonderful girl, Gina. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the perfect symbol of morality, don't you think, Lynn? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to move on, okay? Hey, okay, bye-bye. Take care. See, here, I can discuss anything. I can discuss movies I haven't seen. It's 27934. Well, they just filled up again. Hi. Hi. Uh, wanted, there is a comment that, that has been totally forgotten and pretty much overlooked that uh, General Blackhead made. Yes. <laughs> uh, when he was interviewed on television. And he said that he wanted to make this into a war of annihilation. Did he say that? Yes. And he said it speaks for George Bush's humanity that he vetoed the idea. Well, what does it say for Schwarzkopf? I know. But a war of a night... What the hell was the thing otherwise? Well, the fact is, is ask the Iraqis now, it pretty much was a war of annihilation. They'll, they'll Except they'll... for the one person that, you know, maybe should have been annihilated. It wasn't. Yeah, I mean, it is just so bizarre. I mean, it's like... We have watched an instant myth being created. Yeah. I mean, it's a myth. Nothing that everybody believes about this war is true. And when you try to tell them what the truth is, nobody wants to listen. I have found that if you do say, do you know that Iraq is a nation of 17 million people, half of whom are under the age of 15, with a military budget in 10 years that was one-eighth of what the military budget of the United States is in one year, you get a little bit of reaction. I also find that if you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, most people, I would say 90%, and I, I, I'm an idiot. I talk to people on elevators and, you know, and all <laughs> of that when I'm especially agitated, which is all the time. <laughs> These days, yes. And, uh, I mean, I, I really, Mars, are you kidding? Uranus. Uh, I find that most of them, 90% of them, will agree and say, yeah, you know, uh, it, it really shouldn't have been. But they will still go to the parade because they're afraid. Well, you do better than I do because I can't get anyone to admit it shouldn't have been. It's, it's great. It's America. You know, we won. You know, and who was it who said, somebody last week said it was like fighting a war against the Sisters of Mercy. You know, I mean, they had no army. I mean, that was the other myth that they had this... This fantastic army, you know, of these, these murderous Iraqis, you know. I mean, what did they do? They ran away. Right. The elite. And then we killed them. The elite. They never use that word without elite. Like, this is something, you know, you expect to see goose-stepping uh, SS troopers when you say that. And, uh, and then oh, you have... I, absolutely. I mean, they were so underarmed that these famous Patriot missiles that were shooting down these dumb Scud missiles, which were nothing more than, than glorified buzz bombs from World War II, you know, they moved those in. And the truth of the matter is those are anti-aircraft missiles. They're not supposed to shoot down missiles. They knew damn well that Iraq had nothing to begin with. But we created a... Mi and I'll tell you what scared... The thing that scared me the most, there's a little kid on my block named Emily who's six years old, right? Now, these kids, they don't know... I mean, they don't really know anything. She is in love with General Schwarzkopf. Oh, God. I mean, well, I mean, look, she sees this guy, you know, he looks like a nice guy. 
And here's this perfectly sweet, wonderful, extremely brilliant little girl. And she just says, oh, mommy, they were doing laundry yesterday. She said, I want to go home and watch General Schwarzkopf. You know, I mean, so, ne- so who knows what little lady, although I will give credit to kids that they kept asking yesterday, what'd you like best in the parade? Every little girl said, the baton twirlers. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so that was all right. They liked the baton twirlers and they liked Jump Sister Jump, those ladies that jump rope. Yeah. You know, the you little know, boys liked all the military junk. If you're wondering about Schwarzkopf, what do you expect from a nation that oh. Ronald Reagan, a kindly grandfather... I mean, you look at this face, he's, he is the most vicious, mean, nasty man. George Bush is not even human. Look in his eyes. Oh, well, George Bush, oh, well, look at Dan Quayle's eyes. But George Bush, you know what I like now? Twice in one week, there's a thing in, I think, Newsweek or U.S. News and World Report. But it wasn't once. It was twice in one week while he was making speeches, George Bush started to cry. Right. I, I mean, what is this crying garbage all of a sudden? Hitler did the same damn thing. Do you remember how many pictures there were of Hitler crying? When he went to his mother's grave, he cried. When he took flowers from little girls, he cried. This is, this is something... That Goebbels never was successful in creating, and the United States now has created everything that Goebbels could not do. Well, I also said yesterday that, it, I mean, this, these parades were like Nuremberg rallies, you know. I mean, it is, well, I'm glad that we at least agree, you know, so I don't, you just reminded me of something. Yeah. That has nothing to do with this. But we were talking about George Bush crying, and I thought about what a sensitive new age guy he is. <laughs> and you remember during the the uh, fundraising, I was playing this uh, this thing, buy me, bring me, take me, don't mess my hair. I was playing from a CD. Yeah. Well, they're playing at the bottom line on Monday night. Oh. These four women. I meant to, I meant to mention that at the beginning of the show. The th- CD that I was playing while we were raising money, mm-hmm. folks. You can see them live. Megan O'Donoghue, Christine Lavin, Patty Larkin, and Sally Fingerette Monday night at the bottom line. Oh, two other, two other brief things. One, in addition to the outrage of, of what has been a peace church being used as a war rally. What happened to those people? Ministers, priests, they arrested people at that church by plainclothesmen and a church which is inviolate. Even in medieval times, they didn't violate the church has been violated and they arrested these people. They didn't arrest them, they threw them out. They only arrested one person and that was outside. They just took them out. But that was the ones before, the ones that were sitting in from the morning. I thought, oh, they did, they only took them out. Okay, I thought they They took them out and then they joined, there was a demonstration across the street and they joined that demonstration and at some point outside they did arrest one person. But you know what the really cool thing about those people in the church was? They were invited. You needed an invitation yeah. to get into that church, which means these were people that nobody had any idea what they really thought because they had been invited to that, that ridiculous service. Yeah, yeah, which, which was... Who know, ever I mean, heard of generals? It's bad enough to have generals speaking in a church, but the Secretary of Defense? I mean, what was Richard Cheney doing speaking in the Cathedral of St. John? I swear to God, God, I bet that, that cathedral is struck by lightning. Oh, I, it, and, and, but its history is what makes it so appalling, you know. I mean, this is the only church that Frederick Frank, who you may or may not know, uh, who is a wonderful sculptor, uh, who makes icons and uh, just wrote a book, To Be Human, uh, Against All Odds, uh, which says pretty much what you can say. Uh, this is the only place where he has sculptures and they desecrated them by allowing this. I think so. I, really, somebody keep in mind when Paul Gorman comes back in September, since he works there, would somebody call him up and ask him what the hell this was all about? And the other point that I wanted to make, which was brief, this guy with, you know, all of the parading on television and all of that, you will, number one, notice that as soon as the war started, and they captured Iraqi soldiers, they were on the front pages, and they were all over the headlines, and all over TV. They had all of these Iraqi soldiers being paraded. That was all right. And number two, for this country to dare to talk about mistreatment of prisoners when within our lifetime we watch people being thrown out of helicopters in Vietnam, 
when, yep. we, when we teach torture and murder to the entire world. Yep. When death squads are our are, are, are under the command of our Green Berets all over Latin America. But you're not supposed to think about that. You're supposed to go into the middle of the street and buy a red, white, and blue hat. Even even the homeless guy on my block, one of our regulars who collects cans, yeah. he was wearing a red, white, and blue hat yesterday. Yeah, I saw a homeless lady in the... Uh, you're just supposed to... In the Port Authority yesterday with an American flag stuck in her hair. Well, our homeless guy had a very nice red, white, and blue cap. And, and what you're supposed to do, instead of thinking about all that reality, is just go out and yell, USA, USA, like some cretin. Oh, yeah. Oh. Football game. Oh, well, or Arsenio. The other thing I love is that now everybody, what is that, they bark or something? I've, not, I've never watched, they go... Ruff, ruff, ruff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like this is the highest ideals of American democracy demonstrated. The barking comes by people barking a game where they called the the dog pound is the uh, what they call the, the the end zone. I believe it's uh, Cleveland that had the dog pound. Oh, you mean this is a football thing? <laughs> thing. Oh, see, I don't know about things like that. All an analogy for f- football becomes. The, the metaphor for everything, and it's, it's you well, know, mindless a because nobody pretty gets good it. one. That's, that's, you know, the point of football and this kind of organized mayhem, which, incidentally, in my ideal society, I would have a lot of because I think that, that the, the testosterone level needs an outlet, and this is, you know, a pretty mild outlet compared to war. Uh, this becomes a metaphor for the real killing, which is insane. Oh, the whole thing is insane. I'm going to move on. Bye. All right? Bye. Bye. You know what also is upsetting? You open the paper today, and even the liberal columnists, it's like, well, you know, there were different sides to the parade, but it did go off so well. It's like, you know, I, I, you, it sounds to me like a Nazi Germany. Well, you know, it may not be nice to gas all these, these Jews and everybody else, but, you know, the machinery works so well. The liberal columnists, Today, we're, we're very, uh, li- even Sidney Shanberg was a little low-key, as far as I'm concerned. Hi, you're on BAI. Hello, Lynn. Hi. I uh, agree wholeheartedly with everything you said today, but I'd like to bring up another subject. Uh, you spoke about sexism when you first came on the air. Yes. I'd like to know what you think of Jap jokes. Oh, that thing about, oh, I think they're very funny. <laughs> I like chap jokes. Well, I'll, I'll let me read something to you. All right. Is this going to, like, get us to lose our license? No. Are you sure? Uh, on the contrary. Okay. I preserve your license. Okay. This is from the Anti-Defamation League. Incidentally. Yeah, well, they're not my favorite organization. Well, they're not always mine, but sometimes they're on the mark. I'll tell you something about chap jokes. This is that thing with Z100 last week for people who missed it. Well, it was no, having this, a contest. Uh, on WBAI. Clue uh, and Curtis at night. Here's something about Jap jokes. If I may read a few items from a newsletter. The acronym Jap once stood as a mildly taunting, if not self-deprecating, description of a woman indulged by a morning, by her nouveau riche parents. Recently, however, the slang term has become nothing short of an allowable epithet available to Jews and non-Jews alike as a casual phrase which wishes to denigrate Jewish women. As the slurs depict her, the new princess is not only indulged, she is insatiably greedy for money, jewelry, and clothing, and has no appetite for sex or ideas. She's despicable to the point of being dangerous to society, and the oh. above joke implies must be annihilated. They illustrate this with a uh, T-shirt which says, Back off, bitch, and it has a uh, mark across it. Uh, supposedly. What do Curtis and Clue have to do with this? They were encouraging the telling of Jap jokes. One well, night. I think they're very funny. And, and you know something? This, this came up again with the people hanging out in the laundromat where I'm working. And, like, one woman said they used to call her an Irish-American princess. You well, know, why I don't mean, they tell Irish-American princess? Because IAP doesn't sound as good as... I mean, it, it doesn't people... Sound as- you know what it is? People need to lighten up. Listen. People need to lighten up. Jap jokes are funny. 
because of the word, of the word Jew. Why aren't Italian American princess jokes funny, or Japanese American princess jokes funny, or Irish American princess jokes funny? Or black American. Because the fact is, is that people tell Jewish American princess jokes. Yes. And people tell jokes about Irish people drinking too much. And people tell jokes about Italian people, you know, being, about Polish people being stupid. And about, I don't know what the Italian jokes are about, frankly. But there are, there are ethnic jokes. They're not going to bring down the society. Oh, they're not you. serious, you know, they're not serious bigotry. They're funny. You know, and if everybody would just lighten up and, and you know, they tell, there are jokes about men. There are jokes about women. Why can't you tell these jokes? Well, here's, here's something that appeared, first of all, in, in campuses across the country, Jewish women are sig- signaled out for taunting. When they walk... How do you know a Jewish woman from a non-Jewish woman? Point. That's right. But uh, apparently... They know, because they yell How? Jap, jap at them. Here's something else. So they yell jap at them, so what? Well, I wouldn't like my granddaughter, who's going to go to college in two years, to be called a jap. She's never encountered any kind of stereotype. Bigot. But it's not serious. Don't you understand? It is not Apparently, serious. You don't understand. Look. The Anti-Defamation League of the B'nai B'rith, as far as I am concerned, is a fringe organization of absolute y- y- fanatics. I mean, I don't, I mean, they started this whole thing with Z100 because they were having be a Jap for a day contest. And they're acting as though, you know, Hitler had just taken over a radio station. They are fanatics, which as far as I am concerned, makes them a fringe group. They don't deal with anything important. They harass radio stations. I was harassed by them when I worked at WABC. Saturday Night Live has been harassed at them. They, when something important comes along, they don't want anything to do with it. They're just a bunch of fanatic jerks as far as I'm concerned. I don't take anything the Anti-Defamation League says seriously. Do you understand Yiddish? Not very much. Maybe understand this. Of Yenem's Tuchus is good to Schmeisen. I don't get it and I don't think I need it. I'm going to move on, all right? Okay. I mean, I sat in a room when I was at ABC with two rabbis from the Anti-Defamation League who said, we don't believe in censorship, but, well, I don't believe in any group that, that, that uses that phrase. We, I don't believe in censorship, but, hi. Hi, Lynn. Hi, how are you? Nice to talk to you. I haven't spoken to you since before the war. Oh, wow. Which is, uh, almost seems like years ago. Yeah, do you realize, I was just thinking, this is the beginning of June, and they invaded Kuwait, it was August, it's only ten months. Well, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, right. Listen, speaking of lightening up, you heard about Schwarzkopf uh, using the term military fairies? Yes, oh yes. That was pretty <laughs> funny. He had to apologize. But I wonder if he had to apologize to Elizabeth II for calling her a queen. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I just thought I'd lighten things up a little. I mean, it nobody... So much fun on the radio these days with Bob Grant talking to sex slaves and... Uh, Oh, has he been doing that again? Is Mistress Jacqueline on today? Oh, dear. Yeah, did he have her take Clay, her... Michael, oh. and at I'm one glad point, to it see... got really bizarre. She, he uh, said, are those real? Uh, uh, those? Uh, or is uh, it? And she uses uh, the T word yes. once, but twice, and they don't, don't even believe it. I couldn't believe well, it. Well, that's good. I may get my job back, because actually that means if that happened on ABC, the station manager probably dropped dead. You know, Which Grant means I could really go back to a phony, oh. a fake, a phony now a Bob loves he's that the sex first stuff. one to complain about someone like Donahue doing a show like this, but he does it himself. Well, everybody's a fake, a fraud, a phony, and a liar, as far as I'm concerned. You know, so everybody should read Russell Baker in today's Times has talking about lightening up. He has this great column about Ted Kennedy and the new Puritanism, asking the question, why can't a grown man? who isn't married, go out for a drink with two grown men, you know, his nephew and his son, and run around with women. What's wrong? Why can't he do all those things? Why does poor Ted Kennedy have to say, oh, I'll change my lifestyle? Hey, I hope when I'm his age, I can do the same thing. He's not that old. After all, 
You know, he's had a rough life. I, I, you know. But I mean, the guy isn't married, and they're yelling him for running around with women. You know, what's wrong? Hard to defend the Kennedys these days, but think of the life he's had. A tragic accident in which someone got killed. Two of his brothers shot dead. A brother shot down, you know, flying in the war. It's no wonder he drinks. And what's wrong with... Dr I mean, it's, it's just... I just like the article because the tone of this Russell Baker thing is this thing about nobody should drink, nobody should smoke. You know, like, if you, if you go to have a beer, like, 20 people say, oh, you should go join AA. You can't... And now you can't even tell Jap jokes. What the hell is left? You can't get drunk, you can't take drugs, you can't run around with members of the opposite sex, and you can't tell Jap jokes. What the heck are, are people... That's why we needed a war. Well, you know, they're going to have a movie about the war. The first movie about the war is going to be called Terms of Bombardment. <laughs> <laughs> that Very was actually good. a title that People magazine used on a page in their War Extra Special Edition. Oh, well, everybody had their War Extra. I mean, everybody, you know, they're also, they're making money hands out. You know, they're selling these. They already sold 2,200 of those videotapes of yesterday's parade before the parade happened. Did you get your Desert Storm trading cards? No, do you know that my fa actually the father of that kid Emily who's so crazy about Schwartz Club, he had those months ago. They only got to New York recently. I, I, my candy store didn't have them. There was an ad in the Sunday paper. You know all mm -hmm. those coupons that they put in there. Yes. One of the pages was a ad for this Operation Yellow Ribbon. Oh. Not a religious or political forum. It's simply a non-profit support <laughs> group. Several cards in the set show the actual servicemen whose patriotic parents gave birth to this nationally known organization. Yes, Desert Storm is over, <laughs> and our victorious troops are returning home, but Operation Yellow Ribbon continues to assist the family members of those who took part in Desert Storm. I'll bet. We all need to throw up now. These cards are <laughs> certain to be a treasured keepsake of this tremendous victory. Well, if those cards ever turn up in my candy store, I'm certainly going to buy them. But I'm probably going to have to give Emily the General Schwarzkopf. But maybe she'll trade me a Colin Powell, you know, for my Schwarzkopf. <laughs> Isn't it? Speaking it really... of uh, the war, you were wondering what happened to Barbara Honiger? Yes. Strangely enough, out of the blue, about two weeks ago, she appeared on Tom Snyder's show. Good for Tom. And I was really amazed. It's the first time I've heard of her since she was on your show. Good for Tom Snyder. And no, she, she was much better on his show, actually. She wasn't quite as uh, wacky sounding. Well, I'll tell you something. <laughs> she had a lot of facts down straight and was very convincing. I'll tell you something. I mean, she may have calmed down. I don't know what was going on when she was on the air with me, but, I mean, she walked in, and she... You know that look people have that makes you want to cross the street? I mean, she really looked, like, so whacked out. You know, but, but it, you know, she may feel... Al's going to correct me again, vindicated now. You know, I mean, then, it was during the election campaign, everybody was saying she's just some crazy, hysterical woman, and her presentation, you know, did not help alleviate that impression of her. But, you know, I mean, now that Gary Sick has come out with this and people are taking this seriously, you know, she just may be more relaxed about it. You know, she's not, like, banging her head up against as much of a stone wall. Did you see John Leonard last night on Channel 13... No. 11 o'clock, you know, that half-hour interview show Oh, that thing have. that puts me to sleep, no. Well, it was kind of good. They had two right-wing wackos and two liberals, John Leonard and uh, Gloria Emerson. Oh, yeah. And, oh, Gloria uh, Emerson's one of my favorite people. Of course, Limbaugh today was uh, parodying her voice, saying she sounded like... Uh, Oh. William F. Buckley with too much spit in her mouth. Yeah, let me tell you something. Much as but anyhow, I Leonard made a good point that, that these parades are not just some spontaneous celebration rising up out of the American people. They're actually promoted by the government and they're oh, used yes. very skillfully as propaganda. Of course, because the fact is, is that somebody pointed out when the war ended that, that there was no spontaneous, you know, like at the end of World War II, that famous picture of Times Square, there were no spontaneous celebrations when the war finally ended. Of course these are all used for propaganda. You know, um, maybe you could get Pete Hamill on your show someday. He talks very well about this. Do subject. you notice I don't have any guests? Well, you it's did too one. short. Of, yeah, but it's too short of a show. Believe me, if I had a guest, I would have Gloria Emerson because she just she was she was in uh, Gaza for a year and she just wrote a book. I don't know much about her, but she was very impressive. Oh, she's what she was. I'll tell you about Gloria. 
Gloria Emerson was a war correspondent for the New York Times during the Vietnam War. So you can imagine what kind of, you know, tough broad she is. Because in 1968, they didn't send women, you know, over where there were wars. And she, she uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for, I, I don't think, I'm not sure for reporting, but she, for another book she wrote. She's like a real heavy-duty person. No one of the right-wingers hate her. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. If they know who she is, she's like kind of a low-key, heavy-duty person. A lot of people never heard of her, but she's in trouble now because she, you know, felt rather sympathetic toward the Palestinians. So, you know, all the, uh, you know, the anti-defamation types are not fond of her now. Yeah. Did you happen to hear uh, CBS FM this past weekend with all the old jocks from WABC? A little bit. Yeah, I heard a little bit. I thought it was pretty funny. Cousin Brucey is the best. I love Bruce Morrow. You know who I miss? If I would ever have a guest here, I'd have Cousin Brucey. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He's kind of, you know, this all-American, probably pro-war type, but he is a cool guy. Yeah, but he's just so nice. <laughs> but you know who I really miss, and maybe you remember this guy, Murray the K. Oh, yeah, sure. Wasn't he amazing? I loved it. The I most used to original listen- radio personality. But never forget that New York has got the best disc jockey that ever lived who's still on the air, on K-Rock, from 8 to midnight on Sunday, is okay. Vince Skelsa. Yeah, I like him, too. Who is just the best. I have to move on. Okay, Lynn. Good talk Take to you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Because all my little lights are blinking. Hi. Hi, Lynn. How you doing? Okay, how are you? Uh, not too good. Uh, I didn't understand the parade, uh, because uh, there's so many homeless people and, you know, elderly people in trouble and I, I just thought they're spending the money on the wrong things, you know? Yeah, but see, the problem is, is that they collected all this money privately. And what's pathetic is, you couldn't collect $5 million privately to help the homeless. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Uh, why? What? The Philippines, the wrath of God, or not? That's today's topic. Highly political. All right. Iraq after the war, public health catastrophe. Here, a first-hand report from Elizabeth Benjamin from the Harvard University Student Commission on Civilian Casualties. That's the report that came out from Harvard um, saying that 170,000 Iraqi children under five will die in the next year because of what we did. That's Wednesday, June 26th. Well, I get to announce this again next week. Wednesday, June 26th at 7.15. And it is not in Manhattan, folks. It is at the White Plains Hospital Auditorium, the corner of Post Road and David Davis Avenue in White Plains. All right, I will save this so I can announce it next week again. <coughs> okay. Peace prospects after the Gulf War. Speaker, Israeli peace activist... Mikado War Warshavsky, editor, News from Within, and the founder of the Alternative Information Center. This is going to be Sunday, June 23rd, from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Village Gate on Bleecker Street between Thompson and LaGuardia Place. Okay, that's this Sunday. They want you to pay like four fifty. Thursday, June 20th. Oh, there are many things going on Thursday, June 20th. This is one. You are cordially invited to attend an international evening to benefit Imani House on Thursday, June 20th from 6.30 to 10.30 at the Banquet Hall, second floor, 345 East 46th Street, the corner of First Avenue, honoring Dr. Jane Martin, Senior Program Officer of the African American Institute. Imani House organization is dedicated dedicating this evening to the orphans of the Liberian War. There will be speakers, African dancers and drummers, gospel singers, and the only important thing, which is a buffet and hors d'oeuvres. Guests are welcome. Donations are appreciated. For information, 718-385-2082. That's this Thursday. Now, this Thursday morning, okay, you can go to a demonstration. I know the well, you know, the war isn't really over for the poor Iraqis, but it's over as far as we're concerned. So you people that are suffering 
from withdrawal from demonstrations. A demonstration for the legal services strike, which is still going on. If you tune in every Saturday at noon to WBAI, except the last Saturday of the month, uh, you hear Scott Somer, who does housing, the housing show. And he is a member of the legal services staff, and they are out on strike for nearly 12 weeks already. So there is a demonstration Thursday at 11 a.m. at 350 Broadway, which is between Leonard and White Street. So you people who like to demonstrate, way to go. That's where you go. Okay, here's my favorite thing. is free concerts in Central Park. Let me just tell you what's coming up. In case you didn't get the Village Voice two weeks ago, where they stuck in this big list of all the free uh, Central Park concerts. This Thursday night at 8.30. Now, all these concerts are at 72nd Street in the middle of the park. So you can come in from either the east side or the west side. Thursday are two groups. One is called Garaz and one is Brigada S. The best in rock from the Eastern Bloc. Did the person who wrote that know it rhymes? Garaz forges a hard-driving ensemble that sets the standard for Eastern European rock and roll. Brigada S is the hottest, hippest band in the Soviet Union. Well, I'm sure that that doesn't mean much to us. But it's free. So if you want to see communist rock and roll or ex-communist rock and roll, Thursday, 8.30, 72nd Street in the center of the park, Friday night at 8.30, from Bali, the Topeng Clowns. They're from Bali, accompanied by the 18-piece Dharma... Swara Gamelon Company, the Topang Clowns portray a variety of comic characters in dance. Saturday, this is all free in Central Park, folks. This is hot. Al Green. Al Green's name is synonymous. Here comes Lee Ryan bringing me a fax. Limbaugh. Oh, God. <laughs> The facts about Rush Limbaugh. Oh, goodness gracious. Rush Limbaugh, American uh, featuring political heavyweight. There is no political heavyweight heavier than um, Rush Limbaugh. Saturday, July 27th from 8.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the Long Beach Arena in Long Beach, California. Well, they don't say who any of the other guests are. Isn't that outrageous? Oh. Russia's doing so well. All right, Al Green. He swings with the inimitable style and vigor that make such hits as Let's Stay Together and Tired of Being Alone classics. That's Saturday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and Sunday at 3. Fefita La Grande and La Gran Manzana. Dominic oh, this sounds great. Dominican accordion queen. Fafita La Grande has wowed audiences for two get decades with her conjuncto, tipico, traditional merengue played at great breakneck speed on an accordion, no less. And La Gran Manzana is the Big Apple's conquistador of merengue. Here's Lance. Gee! Everybody just comes and goes. All right, so these are all free, Saturday and Sunday, Al Green and, and the Dominican Accordion Queen. How would you like to be known as that? How would you like to go through life known? It's like, I feel so sorry for that woman. I mean, aside from the fact that she got killed. The woman who got killed on 69th Street, here she's working at like some bank or something. And she's going for a graduate degree. And she will forever be emblazoned in everybody's mind as an ex rockette You know, something she put behind her. But it sounds so much better in the newspaper to say x rock had murdered. I was trying to explain to somebody last night, you wouldn't believe who if I told you, why that case is the result of racism. The, the, the fact that, that the man that murdered that woman should have been in prison for attacking the other woman that he attacked last year, and it is totally racism that he wasn't in prison because nobody cared that the woman he attacked in the first place was a black, you know, probably, certainly everybody admits, including her, that she likes to drink, you know, probably an alcoholic. So nobody, you know, no, who cares? So they didn't do anything about it. They give the guy 30 days in jail. And I was trying to explain to this person 
last night. How you see how racism turns itself around, you know, and comes back on the on the white establishment. You know, because here, if somebody had cared about the poor black woman that that he attacked with an ice pick, he poured kerosene under her door and tried to set her apartment on fire, and he broke in through a window once or twice. But who cared? You know, the woman was drunk all the time. You know, so nobody did anything. I couldn't explain it to that guy. He didn't seem to understand it. Um, the U.S. Navy, get this has launched a formal investigation into allegations that U.S. servicemen on the second day of the Persian Gulf War shot Iraqi soldiers as they tried to surrender to a naval combat team, naval officials said yesterday. It is the first major publicly acknowledged inquiry that the military has launched into charges of wrongdoing by U.S. military personnel. According to an anonymous letter received by the U.S. by the Navy, U.S. troops opened fire on Iraqi soldiers occupying some of the 11 Kuwaiti-owned oil platforms in the waters of the Persian Gulf, even though the Iraqis had raised white flags of surrender. Well, I guess they were practicing for the turkey shoot, as they called it, that came on the last day of the war. Oh, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Um... All right, I have been thinking. I'm Lynn Samuels, by the way, and this is called Talk Back, and it's on every day from 4.30 to 6. I'm here on Tuesdays. Malachi McCord, or I understand his brother yesterday, uh, whose name escapes me. I'm working in the laundromat when these shows are on. I never get to listen. Um, Malachi McCord, or a member of the McCord family, is on on Mondays. I'm here on Tuesdays. On Wednesday, Malika Lee Whitney, and Thursday, I have to find up find a new thing to call him. The one and only Playfell Benjamin. Okay. Think about this. Think about this. This has been fascinating me all week. What the main myth of the industrial era, which started when? I don't know. I don't know any history. I'm sure you've all caught on to this. The whole point of the industrial era of modern America is to prove our conquest of nature. You know, I mean, first, we, we tr trapped steam into a steam engine. You know, everything, every invention that comes along is somehow taming some part of nature. You know, you can take steam and you can turn it into power. And we go on and on through the Industrial Revolution, through the, you know, right up until today, we've tamed nuclear power. We can build dam, we can turn rivers, you know, with dams and ele electricity. We've, we've conquered electricity. We can make it work for us. We've conquered nuclear energy. We can make it work for us. We have, we have taken the concept of time and conquered the concept of time practically with the information explosion. I mean, now you have faxes and telephones and satellites up in the sky so that you get information about totally meaningless things just as fast as they happen. And the main myth of, of certainly 20th century America, as, as we have tamed more and more parts of nature, is that man is the master. Man is the master of nature. Well, every now and then, either God or Mother Nature or somebody, because uh, somebody left yesterday's New York Post here, God is a man, uh, which he claims he didn't say, Cardinal O'Connor. But we have tamed nature. We, we have reached dominance over nature. We can do anything we want. Now, obviously, the ecology movement and the realization that we are... We may have tamed nature, but at the same time, we are destroying nature. Got through to people, you know, about 20 years ago, certainly in this country, with the first Earth Day. But every now and then, something happens where you say, Woo! Wait a minute. Maybe we really haven't. This volcano, Pinatuba, in, in uh, the Philippines has not erupted. Now, they keep saying 600 years, but Newsday yesterday said 611 years. This volcano has been dormant. Do you know what 611 years ago was? 
Am I the only person? Now, again, I certainly don't know any medieval history. The last time that volcano erupted, and I don't know how they know. Did people write, you know, I mean, uh, what did they do 611 years ago? How do, how do we exactly know this? But we know. 611 years ago was the year 1380. 1380. Columbus hadn't discovered America. Well, I mean, I know there are people out there. You've all read that book, you know, by uh, what's his name? Kirkpatrick Sale. He didn't really do whatever, you know. But for purposes of me who never read the book, Columbus hadn't. I mean, just think about what was 1380, you know. There was nothing. Who knows what was going on in 1380? I certainly don't. And that volcano has sat dormant for 611 years. Now, in, you know, the Times, the Science Times today, I walked in and somebody shoved it in front of me. You know, killer asteroids. There's somewhere a killer asteroid that could bang into the Earth and that's the end of us. That doesn't surprise me. I don't need to read the Science Times. I have got this really strong feeling. This sounds crazy. I'm getting into Mary, Mary Houston territory here. Plus, my headphones are cutting in and out, so I'm, I'm hearing, like, uh, reverberations in my ears. But every now and then I get this really strong... You look up at the sky, and you get this really strong feeling, you know, that maybe civilization had, had advanced, if you call this advancement, to this state once before and was destroyed, and that we're just, like, doing it all over again. I mean, there's no way to know that. You know, it sounds crazy, but who knows? If, if a previous civilization was totally destroyed, we wouldn't know about it, would we? So it's possible. But this volcano sat there dormant. And here the United States built two military bases, you know, one right near it and one 25 miles away. And suddenly, I mean, think about this. After the Gulf War, after this horrible, unjust, unnecessary political war, you know, after the, after the kickoff, the, the Gulf War being nothing more than George Bush's kickoff to the 1992 campaign, that's all it was. You know, instead of making a speech in New Hampshire, the guy had a war. This volcano erupts. And it erupts, right? I mean, there's Clark what is it, air, an Air Force base or whatever it is. One thing I was thinking of, at some point they evacuated most of the people from Clark Air Force Base, but they left about 1,500. Who were those people? They left. I mean, like, how did you decide? You know, how do you say to somebody, well, Joe and Mo and John and, you know, Geraldo and, you know, Seymour, you all leave and go to Subic Bay, but you people, you stay. Oh, how did they decide that? You know, I guess if you're in the Army, they tell you, Yes, well, my orders are to stay here right at the bottom of this erupting volcano. I think I would have left anyway, you know, that's why I could never be in the army. You say, what, are you out of your mind? You know, like, I'm going to sit here and watch this volcano erupting all over me. And now they're sending home all the military dependents. So first of all, you think about people's lives being disrupted. You know, that's something they show you, these poor Filipino people. And, you know, who now their homes are destroyed. You know, they've got 14 inches of volcanic ash. You know, I mean, I can't even imagine that schmutz. And now they, they had typhoons. It's pouring rain. Cars don't go. Animals can't even go through all this gook. They're sending home, what, like 20,000 dependents from Subic Bay now. But what is the meaning of this? You know, now I know, you know, there's atheists out there and there's agnostics out there and you're going to say, well, you know, the volcano didn't erupt and then it just erupted. And, you know, tell me about plates of the earth moving. I don't believe that for one minute. Every now and then, God or Mother Nature or whatever you believe it is has to stand up for itself and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Guys, you haven't tamed nature. Taming nature is impossible. And do something really dramatic. Now, of course, this makes no impression on the people it should make an impression on. I mean, Rick, my friend Rick, oh, I don't know if he wants his name mentioned on the air, but, you know, he thinks it's like Mother Nature doing this. I think it's God. You know, I think this has to be connected to the Gulf War. 
you know, since there happen to be these two American bases right there, you know, I mean, this is the Philippines. This and now apparently Imelda, you know, thinks that it, that it's punishing everybody, you know, just for being nasty to her. But Imelda, if you were there, you'd have to ruin all your shoes walking through the volcanic ash. You know, oh God, she'd have to go out and buy like another fourteen thousand pairs of shoes. She, oh, I ruined my shoes. But there has to be something more. Maybe it's a warning. You know, maybe it's a warning. This isn't Bangladesh. You know, this isn't where it's so easy in this country to just add ah, it's Bangladesh. You know, this happens all the time. It's not Mexico City. These are American bases being affected by this. You know, Americans, I mean, people are now being told, you know, send your wife home, send your kids home. People's lives are disrupted. And it's not because George Bush wanted to start a war. It's not George Bush ripping people from the bosom of their families to send them off, you know, to some desert, to some stupid war. This is an act of God or an act of Mother Nature saying, you better pay attention to me. You people better, you know, straighten up and fly right. Because when I want to make trouble, when you've messed around with me for too long, and I get mad. I can wait. I have forever. I have infinity. You know, I'm God. I'm nature. You know, time means nothing to me. I can sit here and wait 611 years. But when I get mad, you better pay some attention to what I have to say to you. Now, I think a lot of people think this. I mean, nobody, I don't hear anybody saying this. You know, I'm sure, you know, Paul Wonder's probably out front. You know, people who don't believe in God say, oh, it's just a coincidence. Oh, it just happened. I don't believe that, not for one minute. See, the problem with God is, is that God does everything is supposed to teach you a lesson. I really believe this. Everything that happens is supposed to, well, it's also, oh, God, I, this chair is terrible, speaking of God. And if God really is a man, then I guess you're dealing with testosterone, too, you know, which is another problem. But everything's supposed to teach you a lesson. Now, the problem is, is either a lot of people don't realize that everything's supposed to teach you a lesson, or you sit there, you know, saying, well, what's the lesson? You know, what good is a lesson? You know, it's like a mystery class, <laughs> you know, what good is the lesson? If you can't figure out what it is, what am I supposed to learn from this? Well, I think what man is a very interesting piece. Actually, the July Harpers uh, has many interesting pieces. One of them is by Christopher Lash about religion, you know, and about man, you know, man's uh, t using science, you know, as a substitute for religion. Very good. What? I have a card. That's it. You're interrupting. I'm speaking from my heart about God. You come and play your card. It's called skin. Come in and find it. If you want me to play well, it, find it. You're talking it. about religion, and that means it's something inconsequential. Four? Six? Four. I don't like six. Neither do I. See, I had to mention his name, so you had to come in, so now we have to. I would, if it, you should tell me. You know, you know I always would play a card. But he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe this is the wrath of God doing this. Well, let's see what this is that he has. I was just about winding up anyway. Why don't any of these little lights light up? Is this on? On, off. This has no on and off button. I guess it doesn't work. Number five works. Let's, let's hear this. Snapper it was. Big as a pig and vicious as hell. Got my hand. Can you beat that? A few years later, a dog almost chewed off my ear. Then a wasp stung out my eye. Thirty years a sheriff, and all I've had to contend with are vicious animals. But now, we got a new kind of animal. One I ain't seen before. Philip Ridley describes his new movie, The Reflecting Skin, as sick. On Saturday, at 5 p.m., Paul Wonder interviews Philip Ridley, director of the unsettling new film, The Reflecting Skin. That's Saturday at 5 p.m. on WBAI New York.
Well, you want my, would you like my particular view of this? Listen to the interview by all means. Don't go see that movie. Oh, God, that was one of the, oh, that was the kind of movie. <laughs> I hated that. Now, I don't know, Paul maybe liked it because he interviewed the guy. And Lenny Lopate, I know, liked it because he interviewed, uh, I guess, also the director. I hated this movie, The Reflecting Skin. It's the kind of movie where they say perfectly serious things. And the audience laughs at them because they everybody, all these little kids keep getting killed in this movie. And there's one little boy left and, and you know, finally he's getting on everybody's nerves. And somebody says, why don't you go play with your friends? And he says, because they're all dead. And I was at a critic screening and everybody cracked up. I think it was just, a, it's one of these movies that's so personal that, you know, it's like, I don't know why this guy thought anybody else was going to be interested in it, but I'm sure Paul did. I'm sure it's going to be an interesting interview. Just don't let it uh, lull you into thinking it's it's a movie you want to see. It's terrible. All right, so I don't know. Am I crazy? And if anybody is like a medieval scholar, which probably lets out most of my regular callers, um, what was going on in 1380 in the Philippines, or anywhere for that matter? I just dragged out a distant mirror that Francis Tuckman book about the, the, the calamitous 14th century, I dragged it out, but I didn't read it, so uh, I don't know. But am I totally crazy? I mean, I really thought I was crazy thinking this was like some sign from God. And then I talked to Carolyn yesterday, and she said, oh, you should talk to Rick about that because he thinks, you know, I mean, this has to be some lesson somebody is supposed to learn. And, you know, this government is never going to learn it. You know, this government's never going to figure out what they should and shouldn't do. This is WBAI in New York, and it's... 4.57 or 58 or something. I can't even see the clock. Hi, you're on the air. They're running. They're running. Come pick up the phone. Hello? Hi. Oh, Sam. Oh, hi. Hi. I was wondering what had happened to you. Mm. I tried to call. I, I wrote, like, a little, because I didn't think it was very good to have, like, a parade for the ending of the war. I didn't either. Yeah, so, um, I wrote, I wrote a little speech. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, how can you have a party over a war? A war isn't something to ha have a party over. It's something to be glad is over. How can there be victory in war? If all those innocent people were killed, even a lot of American soldiers. So now think about it. How can you be glad? People were killed, even the people who killed people. How can you praise them? If you killed someone yourself, you would... Ha you would have guilt for the rest of your life. So you see, there are no winners in war, only lo losers. So we're glad that most American soldiers came back, but at the end of a war, there's nothing to have a party about. That's wonderful. That's very good. You've been listening to BAI, I can tell. That's very good. Did you write that for school, or did you write it just to read on the radio? Just to be on the radio. It's very good. You're a good writer. You went to Williamsburg, didn't you? Was it fun? Yeah. You saw all the, what they all dress up in the costumes, like from what? What is it from the seventeen hundreds? Yeah, sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen hundreds. And it's like they they just reconstructed town how it looked, and you can go into some of the buildings and when they have like dishes and all kinds of stuff that people use then. Yeah, and there yeah people dress up and you can talk to them and there are like shops like they were back then, but you can buy things. Oh, yeah, well, they have to have stores, Sam. This is America, you know? <laughs> they have to se try to sell you some. You know, you know, it was funny when I found out you went. When I was a kid, they never took us on overnight trips. Mm. You know I mean, you know, they used to lug us to, like, you know, the Museum of Natural History or something for the day. But we never got to go on overnight trips in elementary school. Yeah, no, it's weird, but... Yeah, well, you know, your mother was afraid that you weren't going to put on a sweater or something if it got cold. It was so hot there. Oh, oh, it might. Yeah, it was not hot in New York while you were away, though. Hmm. It wasn't that warm in New York, but you were down south. That's true. It would have been warmer there. So you had a good time. Yeah. School over yet? Um, um, Thursday. And then you're going to camp. Yeah. See, I know your whole life. Already. That was very good. I like what you wrote. Thanks. Do you think you could uh, maybe write it down and mail it to me? Okay. Okay? All right. And then we can have it. Maybe people who want copies 
you know, I could send people copies if they wanted. Okay? Right. And you can become a literary star. <laughs> hey, you never know, Sam, you know? Yeah. It's never too late or too early. Take care, hon. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That's very... You see, it takes a kid to write something so succinct and so straight to the point. You know, that's the older you get, your mind gets all... Oh, the phone number, since there actually are empty lines, and all you people who complain you can never get through, is 212-279-3400. The older you get, the more your mind is filled with just, you know, the garbage of being alive. You know, this thing, you know, Manhattan Cable Television, and, you know, friends of mine, everybody I know is getting lugged into housing court, and your mind is full of that when you're, you're still in school. You can think of something that simple, why there shouldn't be a parade after the war. You know, and write it down, and you see straight through to the heart of it. Hi. Hi, man. What's up? Well, I don't know. I've been talking for 30 minutes, you know. Have you been listening? I don't understand. Nah. Uh, I should have figured. Hi. Yes. Hello. Oh, you're on the air. I have to say that. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's, it's, it's rather interesting. I, uh, called last week, and I thought maybe you would be, uh, more susceptible to this point that I was, uh, I saw some of the uh, military people who were in the parade. I saw them at JFK Airport about 4 o'clock. Oh, what, were they leaving? No. These were the soldiers, young soldiers. I shouldn't say soldiers, young military people. They brought in from Germany in order to be in the parade. They had them all dressed in desert boots, the whole outfit, the brown. Yeah, but they had brought them in from Germany. Germany. Now, and they were in the parade. Now, they brought them in because they said to them, if you go and participate in the parade, we want you to take your vacation now. We will allow you to stop by, enter in the parade, and then go on to your designation. In fact, they were, were stating that this one's going to Mississippi, that one's going to uh, Georgia, that one's going... And they discussed on this bus, uh, taking you from the subway to the uh, British Airways, where I was going. Uh, they were pointing out which ones are going. So, in other words, what they did is fudge the whole thing. Well, I'm not surprised. But I think, yeah, sure, I, that's why I, I spoke to someone else. They didn't seem to get the point. But I think that you've gotten it... Uh, in other words, one should ask, when you're looking out there and seeing these young soldiers passing by looking so happy, they didn't, they weren't even in the effect. Well, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, the whole, look, there were demonstrators, and there apparently were several pockets of demonstrators along the parade, and the New York City police went out of their way to keep the media away. Yes. I mean... Somehow, I am I'm getting very annoyed with well, David Dickens. That's why I think somebody uh, said to me that they heard some uh, lady who was interviewing, and she ran up to one of the military persons that were marching, said, how did you have, how was it over there, and he had stated that he wasn't there. Well, I'm pointing out to you that here are these... There were a lot of them that weren't there. Masses of these, they had put on the uniform. That uniform, that desert uniform, which is a specific type of brown and yeah. slight green. It's a beautiful-looking uniform. They had the new boots. Everything was new. And my friend said, gee, it's all new. What is this? And the guys began to say, oh, we haven't been anywhere. We're just coming from Germany because we're taking our vacation. To and be they in told the us if we go and participate in the parade, they'll allow us to go to now from JFK and other places to where we have to go. In other words, we have to ask this question. How many of the veterans who were in that war wanted to even participate in well, we will never know, because this country is falling under more and more censorship. I mean, it was not a real war. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it, it was literally what the soldiers called it who were shooting the fleeing Iraqis. It was a turkey shoot. <laughs> so it was a yes, fake war, to... and you need a fake parade for a fake so war. So we have to ask that it was, we have to show or admit that it was, uh, it was padded. And staged, and it was staged, a lie, was of course. So that's very, that should be rather embarrassing. I'm sure that the Pentagon oh, doesn't want you to know that. Do you one think other, you one other could embarrass the Pentagon? I, I think that last night when they were discussing the, the mountain erupting since you brought the uh, oh. volcano, it stated that uh, some people were appearing that they had never seen before. What? And they said these people were negroid. 
They used that term on WBAI in the news. They said they were they had curly hair and they were negroid. Well, they should understand that the basic people of most of the Western, uh, of most of that, uh, including Japan, are known as negritos. But I think this was important that they said these people, were, they, uh, WBI's uh, discussion said they were talking about they had never seen the electric lights before and uh, that they had never seen uh, people with lighter skin and that they were uh, there uh, quite amazed at that. But I think that uh, this is uh, uh, enlightening. And if you uh, listen to yesterday's New York, uh, I mean yesterday's WBI, and you'll hear that report, I think that's very uh, enlightening because it will give us some concept of who the people are in the Pacific to begin with. Okay, thank okay, you. Bye -bye. That's very interesting. I, I am not surprised that they had soldiers there that weren't even in Desert Storm. Hi. Hi, Len. Uh, I believe in God, too, but I, I believe in a different sort than you do. I mean, if, if he really dispensed justice like that, like, wouldn't Nixon's phlebitis have moved up to his neck and killed him or something? Yeah, somebody, Samori said that to me. But, you know, he said, why would he kill, like, innocent people? To, but but it, he just has to make a point, you know. I mean, well, we all he know... he sure picks his spots, that's all I think. Well, yeah, but you don't know whether, you know, what's going to happen to Nixon when he dies. I guess I shouldn't say he, uh, given the... Uh, O'Connor uh, controversy. Well, he well, claims he didn't say that. I mean, now he went back on it. In today's paper, he says he didn't say that God was a man. I didn't even read this whole story. I mean, I believe God is a man because when I was a little kid, I had a picture book, you know, and there was this old man with this long white beard sitting on a throne with these angels around him, and that was God. That doesn't bother me. It's amazing. I think O'Connor only, like, preaches... Uh once a month at, at St. Patrick's, and mm. every time he seems to, to make headlines. I think he should, uh, like, do his monthly sermon at Comedy Club, and they should charge <laughs> admission. <laughs> then they, you know what they should do? They should have him host evening at the Improv on A&E. Everybody else does. I, I, I hesitate to say it won't happen. It's, uh, Look, if Henry Kissinger can be a weatherman. Oh, God. You know, who knows what's... I mean, this, this whole society is so absurd... Frankly, if I were God, you know what? I would just have every volcano in the whole world erupt and have a million earthquakes and destroy everything. I, w I would just give up on all of us. Lynn, you, you, your, your negativity is reaching alarming proportions. Yeah, but how else can you think? I mean, do you have, like, what do you have a positive outlook on other than maybe something in your own personal life? Um, gee. See? <laughs> well... Why not go with that? I mean, uh, it's, it, well, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm constantly uh, moralizing and being a defeatist and stuff, but it's just, I don't know, you need some variety. I, I thought you might like to know a friend of mine who doesn't know your name only refers to you as that shrill woman. I, I think maybe you should change the title <laughs> of your show. You to that look. shrill woman? Yeah. I can't. It's called Talk Back All Week. <laughs> There's nothing I well, can do. Well, I was in, I was in Chicago uh, last weekend. I was never more grateful to be out of New York than. Uh, oh, you missed the parade. That's right. With the fake soldiers, apparently. Now, what are we going to do on the Fourth of July, though? You oh, know, that, but no. That'll probably be the last big gasp for a while. Well, now the next big, big, big New York thing is supposed to be next year's Fourth of July, 1992, because that's celebrating Columbus. So that's going to be some gigantic thing. I'm sure there'll be some political controversy to see next year on whether you, you take the uh, correct position on Columbus historically, whether he was the first of the imperialist pigs or, you know, the, the uh, oh, father of us all. That started already. I mean, Kirkpatrick Sale wrote some book that I heard. You know, there are some things I can't get interested in. And that's one. I mean, it's like now with this thing with Zachary Scott, Zachary Taylor. I keep mixing up the actor with the president. Zachary Taylor, right, is the president. They just dug up his body to see if he was poisoned. Right? To see now, would you tell me they had on on A and E on cable this thing Sunday night, a British produced program about the assassination of Martin Luther King? That I mean, I always knew it was a conspiracy, but you couldn't have watched this without, you know, coming to the conclusion that it was a conspiracy. And it was produced in England, so you assume these people have no, you know, particular bone to pick. But how many veterans of the Mexican War really care whether Zachary Taylor was killed? How, why does, I mean, why doesn't somebody look into how Kennedy was really assassinated, both Kennedys, or Martin Luther King? Does anybody care? I mean, who cares anymore? I, if you ask me Zachary Taylor, I wouldn't even know the guy was had been president, to tell you the truth. 
Well, distance is what uh, gets people interested in stuff like that. Oh, so you mean in like 150 years or something, then they'll dig up Kennedy? Then they'll dig up Kennedy's body and say, oh, now we can tell you what really happened. Yeah, I, I think they might just do some sexual research on his stamina, though, rather than... I think that book came out already. That new book about Kennedy apparently uh, has decided he has sex so often they don't know how he even found the time to be the president, much less the energy. Plus the degenerative degenerative, uh, back condition. Well, that's probably why he had sex so often, because he figured he'd better do it before his whole back disintegrated. And they said he he did swimming for therapy at the time. That was uh, only, only half of it, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure. You know, you don't have to go skinny dipping for your back, do you? But people's priorities are just so screwed up. I mean, they're all hysterical about Zachary Taylor. I frankly would be more interested in Zachary Scott anyway. <laughs> I'm going to move on. I'm more interested in the accordion queen on Sunday. I... Yeah, isn't that the Dominican accordion queen? Fafita la grande. I, I, I just can't imagine anyone playing that stuff on the accordion. I just have to hear that. At breakneck speed. Yeah. I love accordion music. I have no idea why, but I just think an accordion is like the funniest instrument. It's a, it's so a you're, great uh, rock and roll instrument. You're going to be out there? I guess, if, I, if, it, if it's not raining or anything, or if it's not 95 degrees. Well, I guess you won't play if it's raining. I mean, the rain would get in the little buttons or something, and who knows, or, or you'd pull the accordion in and out like she spritz herself in the face all the time. You probably can't play an accordion in the... Okay. I think and by somebody... the way, I think Sam is the most intelligent of your regular callers. So do I. It's, it's a shame that, <laughs> you know, uh, Logan and some of the others weren't listening to you when they were a child. Maybe it would have been time enough to save them. Well, I think Sam's parents have something to do with it, too. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye. Yeah, don't forget that. Three o'clock in the park. Well, Al Green is Saturday, but th- this, uh, God, I wish I could be the, I can't be the Dominican accordion queen. I could be like the Jewish accordion queen. Hi. Oh, hello. Like Judy Tenuta. Yes, you say you see a divine hand in recent uh, events. Oh, yeah. Well, do you think there are two people on earth who would agree as to what the nature of the message is and what to do about uh, this uh you know, what What to do as a result? Oh, I'm sure you could get two people to agree, maybe not more. But it's, I, look, when, when some natural cataclysm occurs in, in a society that prides itself on having gained dominance over nature, you know, the lesson is really, you know, the large lesson is really simple. You know, it's like, here I am, this is nature or God, and I'm asserting myself, and I'm just telling you, folks, when I want to blow up or explode or, you know, shake everything up, I can do it, and you cannot, you have no dominance over nature. Well, in the end, uh, it's a really small perturbation in mankind. Uh, civilization goes on it, and in a few years, it's just a, an entry in, in a history book and nothing more. Well, that's because nobody ever learns the lesson. But what is the lesson? The lesson is is, do n- is that man should never be lulled into the idea that he is dominant over nature, mm. that we are in control. We are not in control. I mean, you see this all the time. You see this all the time. You know, every time there's a flood or an earthquake or a volcano erupts, you see that everything man has invented, everything man has done, just pales in comparison to the, you know, the fury of, of what God can come up with. But, but, but the damage done all gets repaired and, and covered up, and in a few years everything is, is, is as before. Yeah, but because nobody learns the lesson or because not large enough numbers. I mean, you know, if you believe literally in the Bible, you know, and I'm not enough of a theologian not to, you know, maybe there's going to be another flood. You know, maybe at some point, you know, God's going to say, you know, it's like, look, you had a warning and you had that warning and the other warning. Well, forget it, folks. You know, and, and any time God wanted to, you know, he could destroy the whole earth. I think the human race is worse than roaches in terms of... Uh, uh sustainability that uh, you know there is no roach motel for, for for the earth oh yes there is we built them all the nuclear power plants there are plenty of roach motels I... I mean you know one of the things they said is that there was a rumor that clark air force base had had some kind of nuclear you know submarines or weapons or something there marine and air force base 
the, or whatever, I don't know, whatever Clark is, whatever that base is closest to the volcano, you know, that there was some kind of nuclear-powered something there, and they, all, they won't even tell you whether it's true or not. Well, you know, and then you say, well, what happens if this thing erupts with burning lava all over the place? Well, that, uh, you know, since it's a secret, I couldn't tell you anything. Well, everything is a secret. <laughs> I mean, we don't know anything. You know, I was just saying to somebody, I had read some articles, I guess, last year, and I can't think of the name of this photographic technique that exists now. There is a technology by which you can take sets of still photographs or videotapes and combine them into one still picture or combine the videotapes so you can create on tape events that never happened. Yes. And you and and the other the more horrifying thing is that there is no way if you got that tape you could ever tell it was created. You know, it's not like cutting the head off a body and sticking it on a picture where it's obvious. Well, the fact is the kind of government we have. How do you know anything you're even seeing anymore really happened? Mm. How do you know that those pictures of those Patriot missiles shooting down those Scud missiles? How do you know that was real? Well, I, I, I don't. Maybe that's why they didn't want to let the news media get close enough to the war. Because then they could have taken instant pictures that were real, and maybe all these pictures we saw about things that happened in the Gulf War were, were manufactured. Maybe a lot of this stuff never happened or never happened the way we saw it. Gosh, uh, we were talking about uh, a, a divine hand in uh, recent events. <laughs> yeah, but How do we get on this? Because that's why God is so mad. Because people are deceiving other people for 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 low political ends. That's that's been going on continuously since the year one. Yeah, but it's getting more and more sophisticated. You know, I mean, I I think it used to be easier to catch people in lies than it is now. I mean, if you can manufacture wholly made up videotapes that look real, you know. Then how is anyone ever going to find out that you're lying? You know, you know, there's not going to be an 18 minute gap like with the Nixon tapes. People are just going to be fed false reality. I mean, people, I, I have a feeling kids in particular don't know reality from fantasy anymore anyway. You know, if you grow up with all this television, I don't know how you can separate things out. But uh, in terms of this deception, don't you think uh, sooner or later, a decade or two from now, there'll be... Uh Retired people who will uh, publish memoirs of these events, saying that I did such and such. Perhaps it will appear in some supermarket type of uh, newspaper, and then we'll make them more legitimate publications. I would hope so, but you can't be sure. I mean, you know, the Kennedy assassinations and the King assassination are nearly 25 years ago. Mm, and I think I'll anybody... Of, uh, of them. Yeah, I know, but you know there was a conspiracy. But one of the things they do with these... Con- it's like the October surprise. Is they say the people who say... I mean, obviously, who takes part in conspiracies like this? You know, not college professors, not PhDs. You know, they're scummy people. You know, they're people you can hire to kill other people. You know, these are not the most reliable, wonderful people on Earth. Well, so when... when well, somebody's got to be a rather... Clever and to make sure that all holes are plugged.